Today, Ogwemike has a new deal with ESPN, and we have a great conversation with her on her role there at the WNBA Finals and plenty more. We're also exploring the expected new CBA negotiations in that league, and we're chatting with NFL running back Jonathan Taylor. It's Friday, October 18th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. In today's episode, in addition to Chinea Wimike, we're speaking with the Indianapolis Colts' Jonathan Taylor. Reporter Colin Sallow breaks down how the WNBA players are likely to use their leverage. An MLB team could be sold, an NWSL team botched its introduction, and an NFL team is moving to the suburbs. Here are your top headlines. Longtime controlling owner Jerry Reinsdorf is open to selling the Chicago White Sox, according to The Athletic. Reinsdorf, who led a group that bought the team for roughly $20 million in 1981, is the second longest active owner in MLB behind the Yankees' Steinbrenner family. Forbes has the White Sox valued at over $2 billion, making Reinsdorf's 19% stake in the team worth over $380 million. He is reportedly receiving interest from a group led by Dave Stewart, who has been at the forefront of an effort to bring a team to Nashville. Flipping college sports, the NCAA has closed a loophole that allowed number 2 Oregon to take time off the clock late in its 32-31 victory over Ohio State. Oregon coach Dan Lanning acknowledged that his team took advantage of the loophole to win the game, saying, We spend an inordinate amount of time on situations, and some situations don't come up very often in college football, but this was obviously something we had worked on. You can see the result. In response to closing the loophole, Steve Shaw, NCAA's coordinator of football officials, said there should be no benefit when a team commits a penalty. Over in the NFL, the Titans granted safety Jamal Adams' request for release on Thursday morning, allowing the former pro bowler to hit the market on the day of his 29th birthday. Titans defensive coordinator Denard Wilson said, At this point, I wish Jamal all the best going forward. It just didn't work out here. He'll have great success wherever he goes. The feel of this one is differs substantially from Hassan Reddick's 9 million plus holdout with the Jets, which came to a head this week when the team granted him a three day window to find a trade partner. Although it ends with Adams off an NFL roster, at least the two sides found a resolution. In the Hoops world, Caitlin Clark capped off her historic rookie season by getting named to all at WNBA first team, becoming the first rookie to be given that honor since Candace Parker in 2008. Other players to make the team include teammate Alyssa Thomas, league MVP Aja Wilson, plus Nafisa Collier and Brianna Stewart, the founders of the new Unrivaled League. On that note, FOS tuned in columnist Mike McCarthy has learned that Unrivaled is preparing a full court press to recruit Clark sometime in the next several weeks. Earlier this week, Unrivaled secured a TV contract with TNT for 45 regular season games. As Mike notes in his piece, Clark moves the TV needle for her sport more than any athlete since Tiger Woods, so this would be a massive get. ESPN has been making big behind-the-scenes moves in recent weeks, and that continued on Thursday morning as the company inked Forbes of its premier basketball analyst to multi-year extensions. Tim Legler, Monica McNutt, Kendrick Perkins, and Chinea Ogwemike will be the media giant's multi-show players for the foreseeable future. We had the chance to speak with Ogwemike just ahead of the official announcement on what this news means for her and the overall increase of eyes and media coverage on women's basketball. That conversation is coming up next. Joined now by WNBA legend and ESPN analyst Chene Ogumike. Welcome, Chene. Thank you, WNBA legend. I'm like that either means I'm <laughs> old or I was good, and I think it's more like <laughs> old now. <laughs> you're, you're you're not old yet. Um, yeah, you can. We'll, we'll go with good. Um, I hope you're not old yet because I think I'm older than you. Um, I, <laughs> Uh, but speaking of the WNBA, how have you been enjoying the finals? What? Like, it's been <laughs> unreal. Game one was one of the wildest games. I was actually just talking to my colleague Malik on NBA Today before we went live, and I said, it was like a soap opera. You're like, oh, they've got the lead, and then they're chipping away, chipping away, chipping away, and then like, oh my gosh, are they going to do it? And it was just bonkers. On top of it, a sellout crowd at Barclays, and then for game two to sort of see the drama of how things ended game one, it has been everything and so i just i like literally can't wait to go to work i normally Mm -hmm. am like that but this one is more than ever before yeah yeah no i totally get that and you know soap opera is an interesting term because i feel like when sports become a soap opera that's when you start attracting a bigger audience like i'm thinking of like you know angel reese and caitlin clark in college and um so yeah what do you think the league can do to like bring this drama to a bigger audience Honestly, just continue to support the players because I always say that the players are tend to be ahead of the league in terms of just ideas and change and even just more so authenticity. And so just going as the players go. But honestly, like there's not much more that can be done. The players are literally putting out the best product ever. We just saw that game one, I think, averaged 1.1. Uh, game two, I think, was like at 900,000. These are the most watched finals so far ever. And so it's leaning into the products, leaning into the drama. 
and just understanding that like creating more avenues for these players to be the athletic heroes that they are to me is so important. I'm also glad that the W changed the format. Four out of seven, yes, because give me freaking seven games of what this has been so far. And then on top of it, one thing that I felt was missing was the opportunity for teams that put their blood, sweat, and tears in getting into the playoffs. Yeah, they didn't get an opportunity to play at home. Now, selfishly, my sister and the Seattle Storm were one of those teams. People think often of Caitlin Clark and the Indiana Fever having the opportunity to play at home. So I'm glad that the format is changing. The game and the business is merging at the right time. And so, honestly, it's just like, it's takeoff time. Yeah, and as long as we're on that, I feel like a lot of people were saying, like, can, you know, add, add an extra game to the finals. And, yeah, the the, sort of the weird format of the first series is a relatively hey, easy fix. Better than single elimination. Better yeah, than single yeah, elimin definitely. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, do you think there are other little tweaks that you see as kind of, like, relatively low-hanging fruit? Low hanging fruit. Um, honestly, like, I think the game is speaking for itself. I wish, I know this is not about like the game. So like part of the media person in me was hoping that we gave each athlete that won an award their moment. And I think sequencing the award so that players and their fans got to appreciate those moments. And also like, you know, just for me and the media lens again, creating ways where we can storytell the season. And that's why I'm really glad to be with ESPN, Disney, a partner that has invested in women's sports, but also there's a lot of work still left to be done. We need more platforms and avenues for us to talk the game because if you watch this year, it was a crash course on women's basketball. And at times it was exciting, but at times it also got adversarial. And so if we had more platforms that were just our spaces to be able to talk the game, educate the, educate the new fans, but also just highlight some of the amazing moments in our own way i think those are the ways that i think can push the game forward yeah i'm actually curious to kind of go a little deeper on that but let's just also talk about your new role at espn or your expanded role um so you just you know struck a new deal where you're going to be the first full-time female broadcaster on nba countdown and wnba countdown you also of course you're on get up you're on first take you're on a lot of shows first of all congrats um and what does it mean for you to have this expanded role i feel so funny saying this because it's so corny and it's so cliche, but like, I'm, li you know, when you go to work and they say you're living the dream, I'm like, I'm living the dream. I really am living the dream. And in my life, when I started playing basketball, particularly when I became a pro, I thought that my end game was going to be, okay, I want to be a champion. I want to be an MVP. I got all-star and I had so many great memories, just whether it's playing with the Connecticut Sun or playing with my sister on the Los Angeles Sparks. I didn't know that life would take me down this path. But this path has been just, I feel like it's God's timing in the sense that, you know, I realized that my impact based off of my situations, my, you know, uh, I guess you can say like the adversity I had to hit as someone who's dealt with injuries, realizing that parallel pathing that with my broadcasting, where in the moment I was uniquely positioned to not only advocate for the players starting in like 2020, but to be a part of this moment that me and my sisters and my sisters in the league never knew would happen now. To be able to story tell that, to be able to, you know, I always tell people working in the NBA, you know, it's not a place that's necessarily designed for us. But by representing the W, female hoopers, young black girls, girls of color, Naija, Nigerian, my culture, like, I feel so seen, even though I always tell people to exist in that space, they see you before they hear you. They judge you before they know you. Nonetheless, we keep pushing through. And so to be able to have a role across NBA and WNBA is like a core tenet of my being because when you play basketball, you go to the park or you go to the court as a kid. If you got game, you got game. If you're a girl, it doesn't matter. If you're a boy, it doesn't matter. If you got game, if you can hoop, if you can score, that's how you earn your respect. That's the mindset I brought to broadcasting. I'm talking hoops, whether it is college basketball, NBA, WNBA, any hoop, everyone knows real hoopers sort of celebrate the game that way and approach the game that way. And to have my role uh, expand into that is just so like in my DNA. Uh, along those lines, I've always kind of thought about like, could is there like a possibility, you know, I mean, you could think of this in a lot of different sports, but I think maybe especially basketball for like crossover leagues where you have men and women playing together. Like on one hand, I want women to like have their space and, um, uh, and not just be like run over by by like a bunch of men in their league. Um, at the same time, like 
the NBA and WNBA already work so much together. You know, there's like this taste of it with Sabrina Ionescu and Steph Curry at the three-point yeah. contest. Um, I, I wonder if there's more opportunities for them to share a court. We already do. You know, we already do. When I played basketball in high school, we used to give our sophomore boys team at Cypher High School the business. When I played at Stanford, our practice players were our family that were cheering for us at our games. When I played in Connecticut or L.A., those are the ones that really helped us elevate our game. And so playing against guys has always been a part of what makes us great and helps elevate us. But I think the reason why the WNBA and women's basketball is taking off is because it's finally treated autonomously. It's its own. I'll give you this quick little anecdote. I learned this lesson in 2020. When we were negotiating the last CBA, I, we were, you know, we had conversations with the league and the league was presenting our sponsors and they switched sl slides of like, okay, these are the NBA sponsors and these are the WNBA sponsors. And I turned to my sister and I was like, hold up, did they change slides or are those the exact same thing? And then we started realizing, you know, we have to find our own sponsors. We are a league full of women. We have different passions, different interests, and we represent our communi communities in unique ways that might be specific to women. And so once that mindset shifted and then we got a commissioner that was very focused on the business of us standing alone i always tell people it's not like a small thing that adam silver with kathy engelbert was like you are no longer a president you are a commissioner you are representing your own thing that's huge that's all the similar mindset that women's basketball has sort of had and owned and creating a space that allows us to be enjoyed and supported and invested independent and so like as much as we are one hoop culture, I love how the W is sort of pivoted into this place where it's like, this is us. Um, and lastly, I always tell people, because people are like, oh, like WBA is successful. I was like, if you had a billion dollar valuation on your own company, how would you feel? You'd feel like you're wildly successful. When you compare it to the NBA, comparison is a thief of joy when it comes to all of the contributions that women's basketball players have had and continue to do. And so... That's been the new spirit of excitement. And re I think it's just really re-energized re hoop fans. It's been um, a new way to appreciate the game for those who are late to the party. <laughs> yeah. And like on the comparison point, when you consider the ages of the leagues, the proper comparison might be like the NBA in the 60s or 70s or something. You know, it's like. Yeah, these, but that was are... the inflection point. And I know so many people have talked about it. Larry Bird, Magic Johnson. But that is what we sort of witnessed. Now that came with the crevices of society. Right. That came with critics, but it did make household names that made appointment television. And that's exactly what we have witnessed the last two years of college and then also transitioned to the pros. How have you seen ESPN, you know, I, you know, in your time there, have you seen it sort of shift in terms of how it covers the W and, and maybe women's sport generally? Yeah, it's been amazing. You know, I feel like when I was at ESPN and I knew the value of what women's first of all, not only the value, but like. The like for a long time, I say this in a funny way, like for a long time, we weren't playing for the paychecks. We were playing for pride. We were playing for legacy. We we're playing to create and leave the game w better than it was for us, for the next generation. And then all of a sudden, you know, slowly we start catching fire. And I, I love making that comparison because it's like I, I'm a big fan of the Hunger Games. And it feels like we were playing the Hunger Games for a long time. Being internal to ESPN, I, there are so many people that have been doing tremendous work that have been laying the groundwork for what we are experiencing now. But I guess through my personal lens, there are three people that have been extremely pivotal. One is Dave Roberts, who took over the NBA and the WNBA a few years ago and started planting the seeds of expanding our coverage. For example, expanding WNBA countdowns and just promoting women's basketball within men's basketball, you know, expanding college game day from men's college game day in college to now women's college game day. Like those things, creating those opportunities for moments to build stories and to celebrate the biggest moments uh, in college, huge. Same thing with WNBA and the pros. So having the foresight of doing that, bringing together a lot of people who have gone and a lot of people talk about, you know, myself, Andrea L. L. Duncan from like March Madness, we all were on our own side. I want to say hustle, like main hustles, whatever you want to call it. L embedded in Sports Center, Andrea doing 511 things, whether it was SEC Network to women's basketball, and then myself pretty embedded in the NBA, but then years prior coming from radio. But to bring us together, that's one thing that Dave Roberts did. It just felt like a sanctuary because we were all 
in a space that we knew, a space that we loved, a space, and then we were battle tested with the industry knowing how hard we've worked to have a voice. And so put that together and it takes off. And I, I'm immensely grateful to Dave Roberts for that. And then on top of it, Jimmy Pataro is the ultimate, and I know it sounds silly, but like, yes, man. We go and we say, we need this, we love this. He's like, yes, how can we make it happen? Now we know some of those things can't happen overnight. That's great. But then lastly, Bob Iger, he has been such a huge supporter of women's sports, taking us from, you know, working March Madness to being on the stage at Disney upfront saying that this is a future that we all believe in as a company and that supporting this means supporting communities. It means supporting confidence and just literally helping inspiring the next generation as we like to do under the Disney umbrella. Like it's just been awesome to have alignment, but also those visionaries that put us in positions where we can be ourselves. And so, yeah, it's taken, but I like, I just think about so many women that have come before me that have sacrificed, that have dedicated their craft, not knowing if this was possible. And so that's why I bring my happiness and my joy every day to women's basketball, because I feel like it's a moment that we never knew was going to happen now, but I'm just privileged and grateful to be a part of it. Do you feel like you have a sense of like like when this league, you know, has, you know, another whatever five plus years to like really come into its own and um establish its own identity even more, like what that's actually gonna look like? You know, I say it to my sister and it's weird and I'm like, it kind of feels in some ways we're experiencing the MBAification of the WMBA. Like you have to you have to talk, you know, dealing with trolls or dealing with you know, I, I say this affectionately. You, I always tell people like, you know, we're moving in the right direction when our legends can talk what they say, what they want to say without, you know, you know, just freely because they are now looked to as voices and they all are, people are educated to who they are and what they've meant to this game. Like the way Shaq, Chuck, Stephen A. Smith, Kenny, now we have like a new generation, not a new generation, our generation is getting the same, you know, abilities and so I think like five years from now first of all I'm just so excited about expansion because we've been saying like there's so many talented players in um, the WNBA and just that play women's hoops globally we need more markets we need more roster spots and we need more avenues to show what this game is and can do and so the fact that we have expansion up to I believe what do they say is it 60 18 in, uh, or 16, I can't remember. I think it's by 16 20. by 27, but there's still one more city that has to be named to get there. Exactly. Like, expansion is something that we've been caring about. It's on the precipice. You know, the new CBA um, situation that could be a potential is going to be interesting when it comes to um, the opt-out potential, because I believe the WNBA has that uh, potential um, soon. So, like... There's a lot of things. This is such a big inflection point. Um, if the players decide to capitalize, it's an it's an inflection point because of, you know, investment. And so five years down the line, I think we're just going to see a robust league where women's sports is not looked to as one thing, but it's looked to as a business, truly entertainment and the best of the best. Yeah. And on that CBA opt out, I mean, I think the guess right now is that the players will opt out. What do you think they want right now? I mean, I look, that's like close to the chest because <laughs> I know the players and I know what the union is passionate about. I just know that they always advocate for what they believe they deserve. And a lot of it is based on facts. And there's no better fact or reality than what we have just witnessed this past year, whether it is attendance, viewership, merchandise, like the players have to have an opportunity to share in that because I know that was in my experience. 2020, that's something that was a priority for us, but it just was, you got to walk before you run. Well, this season was a sprint for um, the WNBA fan, for women's basketball fan, and all that type of stuff. So I'm, I'm anxious to see what the union does, and I think that no matter what, they're in great hands with the leadership. Uh, Executive Director Terry Jackson is phenomenal, and I the cool thing is that, what from my experience last time, is that both sides want the same thing. They want a viable business. They want to respect the players. They want to move the game in the right direction. And now what does that look like? They will let us know. And before we let you go, I want to 
hop across the Atlantic briefly. Uh, you just launched the Queens of the Continent Foundation. Uh, just what is it and what inspired you to launch it? Oh, thank you so much for asking. So I'm Nigerian American, probably Nigerian American. And I had an experience where I, when I was during, uh, I was at Stanford, I'm an international relations major, which required me to go study abroad. And when my junior year, after I lost in the tournament and was like trying to find myself because we lost in the Sweet 16 and not the final four, like all Stanford teams did, I went and studied abroad in Nigeria, my homeland. And to be able to see the passion for the game, I worked a couple of basketball camps and clinics and on top of studying with the Ministry of Petroleum, I was re-energized and I realized that representation truly matters. Now, ever since I was a pro, I've been a family member of NBA Africa. I've been a huge supporter of the Basketball Africa League. I've been to Nigeria, Kenya, Rwanda, South Africa, Ghana to help support the game. But one thing I have noticed is that oftentimes when it comes to building up the infrastructure of sport and building up the next generation of future all-stars and pros, like Arike Agumbawale, Neko Agumike, Elizabeth Williams, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Joel Embiid, Pascal Siakam, Typically, the investment goes to young boys and young men first. And to me, that's a problem because young women have the same passions, but their opportunity gets delayed. But delayed, not denied. And so my um, foundation, Queens of the Continent, is to really cultivate the jewels of the continent, not just when it comes to competing, you know, as, a, some, as someone that wants to learn basketball at the grassroots level, but supporting those who want to represent the African continent and federations and they just need the infrastructure to do so. On top of, through sport, you know, there are opportunities to learn confidence and to walk empowered throughout your communities. And so helping with mentorship and a number of female CEOs to help guide a lot of these young women and girls to be entrepreneurs, to be their own bosses, which they know they are, but they just would love, you know, it's always nice to have a mentor. So a lot of things that we're working on, but it's to prioritize and put young girls and women front and center in their ambitions through sport and beyond. I'll leave it there. Chanae Ogwemeke, thank you so much for joining us on the show. My pleasure. Thank you so much. We all have two ages, our true age and our biological age. Our bio age suggests how healthy or unhealthy we are inside. You want your bio age years younger than your true age. Let me tell you how Field of Greens is helping me do that. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. The Knicks have a new Jersey Patch sponsor. It is Experience Abu Dhabi, which is a government-run agency that promotes tourism to the city. The org will also have ads before, during, and after Knicks games. It looks like team owner James Dolan may have made some kind of package deal here. We learned yesterday that the next Sphere Arena will be in Abu Dhabi. So at some point, you will be able to heed the advice on the jersey patch of a Dolan-owned team, and after traveling to the Middle East, go to a Dolan-owned venue. We have come a long way in a short time on the question of sports washing. When Live Golf started, many golfers, especially Phil Mickelson, were heavily criticized for taking nine-figure deals to join the league. Before that, the World Cup and Qatar led to investigations by high-profile media outlets and bizarre press conferences with FIFA head Johnny Infantino. But huge piles of money have a way of patching over differences, and over time, people get used to all sorts of things. And now Middle Eastern money is almost as integrated into American sports as it is in European soccer. There was very little discussion when the NBA in-season tournament became the Emirates Cup, which is what it will be called going forward. Some people are going to be very offended by Dolan's deals here, given the United Arab Emirates human rights record. But for most, I'm guessing it will fade into the background and start to feel normal enough, which is a big part of what Abu Dhabi is paying for. Also, the video that Experience Abu Dhabi put out to announce the deal is the weirdest thing you'll see today. Search some combo of Knicks, Abu Dhabi, and Bing Bong, two words, and you will see something you did not expect. Over to another attention-getting video. The newest NWSL team announced itself to the world and then promptly apologized. Boss Nation FC put out a video called Too Many Balls, which brashly stated that Boston sports has too many balls. The women's soccer team coming to Boston in 2026 will have fewer balls. This was not a slap together thing either. It involved a brief cameo from Tom Brady. 
The public reaction was not kind, and before long, the team took down the video and released a statement apologizing and saying, we fully acknowledge that the content of the campaign did not reflect the safe and welcoming environment we strive to create for all, and we apologize to the LGBTQ plus community and to the trans community in particular for the hurt we caused. People also took the opportunity to point out that the name Boss Nation is kind of stupid. I don't love it either. All I will say in their defense is that people are heavily biased toward what they are used to. And if you had never heard the name Red Sox and a team, team chose that name in 2024, they would be mocked for all eternity. That said, Boss Nation dug itself a hole here that it can spend the next year and a half climbing out of before they actually launch. Over to someone who probably has opinions on this as well, Chiefs kicker Harrison Butker launched a political action committee over the weekend. As we've covered here, Butker drew some major backlash in May for a commencement speech at Benedictine College, where he said that women should focus on being mothers and wives, not having careers. Then there was a backlash to the backlash. People started buying his jersey, and from March to the end of May, he had the NFL's 11th most popular jersey, just ahead of his teammate, Travis Kelsey. Now, this has gone up another level with the launch of the pack, which is a very rare move for any athlete, especially one that's still playing. Chiefs owner Clark Hunt said he was fine with that, quote, we have players on both sides of the political spectrum, both sides of whatever controversial issue you want to bring up. I'm not at all concerned when our players use their platform to make a difference. I'm wondering if other players are going to start packs now that that line has been crossed. What started with a single comment could lead to a whole new phenomenon. Over to MLB, the A's submitted planning documents that provide a look at what they're envisioning for their stadium in Las Vegas. That stadium looks similar to the spherical armadillo concept designed by architect Bjark Engels. And the documents also show a phase one Bally's Hotel and a phase three Bally's Hotel, one of which looks like a hotel and one of which looks like a giant can of Bally's branded soda. To unlock the $380 million in state funding that the A's got from Nevada, they have to show how they are going to pay for this whole thing, and the team doesn't seem in a rush to do so. Stadium Authority Chairman Steve Hill said last week, the family of A's owner John Fisher has the equity to build the stadium, but if he's going to use it is another question. If he builds this ballpark in the way that he ran the team in Oakland, I can promise that Fisher won't be spending any of his own money. The WNBA players are expected to opt out of their collective bargaining agreement, leading to what will be a very interesting negotiation. Our reporter Colin Sallow breaks down the risks and rewards for the players here, and that's coming up next. I'm joined now by front office sports reporter Colin Sallow. Welcome, Colin. Hey, Owen. Always nice to be here. Yeah, always great to have you on. Uh, so the WNBA and its players union can each opt out of their collective bargaining agreement by November 1st. What do you see as the most likely outcome here? Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost, I think, a sure thing that the players are going to opt out of this deal um, with all the, the rise of um, the league this year, how much you know additional revenue that's coming in. And as well, just the, the fact that there's obviously a new meteorite seal that's going to kick in in 2026. It's been a topic of discussion even before this year, well before this year, that the players felt that they were underpaid. And this is going to be the first opportunity where I really think they're going to have a chance at an adequate amount of salary going their way from the league's revenue. Yeah, right. And so this, this will be the first time they can negotiate after that big media deal, bring in $200 million a year to the league. Um is this basically about money? Like, is that the, the players ask here is more money? I mean, money is obviously the big thing, right? There's there's definitely so many other factors, things that, you know, we'll go in the weeds with, with scheduling and, and, you know, you could talk about incentives and things like that. But money is going to be the main factor. The current, you know, minimum salary for a WNBA player is about $64,000, which for a professional athlete is just, you know, unfathomable, right? Um, the other day I was watching uh, the Connecticut Suns Instagram page and they literally have a video of the f seven or so players on their team that are still playing abroad. And when you look at the WNBA's success right now, you're like, wait, that's still happening? And it's not just still happening, but it's happening for about half of the players on a team that made the semis. So um, th it's definitely going to be, you know, salary. It's just a matter of just how high uh, will that go? Yeah, I mean, the, the playing abroad issue, I guess we can call it, is is an interesting one. Um, because Obviously, with Brittany Griner, it became, um, you know, something that wasn't just like happening in the background. It was a huge, huge, like international issue. Does the does the league have a, a feeling like, like are they going to try to are the league or the players going to try to make it so players can stop doing that or, or just so like readjust the incentives so that they're less likely to? Yeah, I think that's the goal. Um, I've kind of lightly talked, you know, years to, to ago to some players who have played abroad, and 
there's no real set number, I think, that's going to, you know, satisfy players. People, you know, will want what they want. And if they want to play abroad, then they'll play abroad if it, if it means making more money. But I'm sure a raise in the salary, even if you, you know, kind of look at Unrivaled, the, the league that's coming in January, where they're going to offer players a minimum of six figures. I'm sure a six-figure salary could at least change significantly how many players go abroad. Because we're not just talking about you know, time and money that they're spending away from their families. But we're also talking about the risk of injury for your own WNBA career moving forward. Just uh, look no further than Nika Mule, the 13th pick in the draft last year, who within a few days of the Seattle Storm being eliminated, I think tore her ACL um, abroad, playing abroad. So that's a risk that you're taking by playing extra games there. And if you could find a way to stay here, um, with you know x amount of money could potentially be that and i I think it's probably going to be somewhere in the the six figure range yeah and i mean there's a couple aspects of this it's a short season it's you know about half the length of the nba and so there's just time on the calendar for players to you know i bet a lot of them love playing abroad and you know they make more money usually and and you know get to be in a different country um yeah at the same time in other sports where players are, are making millions, usually it's in their contract, you know, you can't play soccer, you can't ride a motorcycle, like you can't go mountain climbing. Like, you know, this is um, the sort of thing you can tell your employees if if you're giving them $10 million a year, whereas yeah, 64,000 and then, you know, but you can't do anything else. Like that's that's obviously a, a different situation. I think, you know, that's a great point you bring up because I'm sure that's going to be discussed in the CBA too. At what point will they remove um, p- allowing players to play in other leagues, right? And it's odd because it seems as though the WNBA is working hand in hand with Unrivaled. I mean, they have to. The founders of Unrivaled are two players who are in the WNBA finals right now. Um, but at what point will that, you know, last? Is it when the, the league has you know, 20 teams in 10 years and is has extended their season to 55 games um, and players are being played, paid, you know, millions of dollars at that point. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see, not just for uh, this next CBA negotiation, but, you know, kind of moving forward from there. And do you see any risks to the players or the league in um, just how this all might shake out? Yeah, I think the one thing is that I think it's a consensus among most people, whether uh, you watch the WNBA or not, that the players are should be paid a little bit more. Uh, It depends on what you're looking at, but they should be paid um, more than what they're receiving now, which is about 10% of revenue. Uh, For example, uh, for for perspective, the NBA players are getting paid about 50% of basketball-related income in the NBA. So um, even just a 20 or 30%, uh, a bump to that number for the WNBA would be huge. Um, And then, of course, the media rights deal, which is going to increase the revenue um, as a whole, um, is going up, you know, three, potentially even four times, depending on, you know, what happens with partners like Scripps. Um, you're looking at salary cap increases that are unprecedented. Um, if you compare it to the NBA, there's one example in 2016 when the salary cap went up by 35% when the league's last media rights deal kicked in, which is the current one right now. And that's why the Warriors were able to sign Kevin Durant. That's why the Lakers signed Timothy Moskov to some 64 65 million dollar deal because salary cap just shot up and what the nba did was they said we're going to do cap smoothing the most that the salary cap can go up every year is 10 percent, so that it isn't unfair to teams like the warriors the 73 win warriors to, to sign new players that is going to be the risk though for the wnba if you're seeing a, a like the doubling of a salary cap you are going to give basically every team the opportunity to sign any available player and look at Brianna Stewart she's already said that she's going to make sure she's a free agent by that that off season so the question for me is okay it seems pretty logical to do cap smoothing for the WNBA but if you do cap smoothing you're denying players uh the right to the money and that that could be and for for the NBA Cap smoothing is fine because the average player salary is twelve million dollars a year, but in the WNBA, that might not be. You know, that's obviously going to be a bigger issue. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Colin Salo, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Of course, Owen, anytime. 
Jonathan Taylor is the running back for the Indianapolis Colts, which is a team on the rise, but still finding its identity. We spoke about that, the changes he's seen in the league, and plenty more. That conversation is coming up next. Very excited to be joined now by Indianapolis Colts running back, Jonathan Taylor. Welcome, Jonathan. How are you, man? I appreciate you taking the time out today. Yeah, likewise. Great to have you on. Um, so let's just start. I'm curious to just get your like state of the Colts, essentially. Where would you say this franchise is right now? Uh, I think we're really excited right now, especially you know coming off a division win on the road. That's always tough. Excited to be back at, at Lucas Oil. We have Miami coming in, so it's going to be another tough contest, but um, always feel good coming off a win, um, and when you get to follow that up, coming back home. Yeah, absolutely. And um, how would you... I'm also curious about your thoughts on like the Indiana sports fan. Obviously, like you know, people are crazy about their football teams everywhere you go. Um, but you know, Lucas Oil has you know been host to you know all kinds of big events and is sort of you know not necessarily it's not in like the biggest market, but I think it's one that that brings out its fans. So yeah, what's it like playing there? It's amazing. Lucas Oil is electric, but what makes Lucas Oil what it is is the people inside, the fans. I mean, like you mentioned, right now it's a great time. It's a great time to be a, a sports fan in Indiana. Um, we, there's a lot of motion going on, um, a lot to be excited about. So um, I'm just con- excited to continue doing my part, my little small piece, and making sure that the fans of Indiana are happy. Uh, so obviously you're playing with, you know, one of these these young quarterbacks, you know, being basically given a, you know, a team and saying that this is your team. How would you assess Anthony Richardson's growth so far in the league? It's been tremendous, and I think it's actually awesome that uh, you know he's able. To, he was able to push through adversity last year. You know, just coming in your rookie year and going down. Nobody wants that. Everyone's looking forward to finally, you know, experiencing the NFL and they get that opportunity. And him going down, I think he used that time to just grow, sit there, you know, and and watch and learn. Um, but I know he's eager this year. He's been eager to get out on the field, go and showcase his talent, help us win a lot of football games. Um, so he's grown tremendously, especially after going through those trials and tribulations last year. Yeah, definitely. And you know, the two of you got out into the community, uh, making a little stop to work at your your local Dairy Queen. Uh, what happened there? Yeah. So today, one, I always love coming together with my teammate uh, Ar, my my quarterback. Um, but. Any place I like to call home, I'll always love to get into the community, connect with the fans, because, you know, that's the people who who support you each and every single week. So we were at our local Dairy Queen today. Um, it, it was a time for us to enjoy a restaurant that we love, but also connect with the fans. Yeah, and getting back to the NFL, um, you know, you're, you're still a young player, but the league's been through a lot of changes, especially this year. What would you say is the biggest change since when you started playing? For me, I would say the biggest change since I started out in 2020 would just have to be my mindset. Of course, the teams have changed. You know, five years is a long time um, in the NFL uh, for a t- one team to stay together. So besides, you know, b- uh, the different relationships that I've built with teammates and coaching staff members, it's really been me being able to change my mindset on, you know, how can I help? How can I help my teammates? You know, a big portion of that coming in was, you know, how can I be the best that I can be? But, you know, as I've gone through, like you mentioned, a lot of different changes, I just want to be able to help the younger guys uh, navigate the NFL, which is a difficult, tough business. Honestly, we were, we were trying to figure this out before the interview. Um, the guardian caps, you know, something that some, some players are trying on right now. Um, were you wearing it in practice squads, but not games? Is that is that accurate? I wore it uh, in the preseason for two games. I wore it in the pre- two preseason games. Gotcha, gotcha. What's your assessment of that? For me, it didn't really hinder any of my abilities. With the small sample size I had, I, the second preseason game, I thought I was going to have a bit more of a sample size, but I ended up only getting about like 10 or 12 plays. So for me to adjust my play style, and it's going to be new for everybody. It's going to be new for players. It's going to be new for referees. There may be situations that come up that refs haven't you know, seen before, so they'll have to figure out how to navigate that, whether it's a penalty, whether it's not a penalty, does the game stop? So for me, it was just too small of a sample size. Maybe if I would have gotten more work in the preseason. Um, but I just didn't want to change kind of my lat- previous season routine without really knowing how it was going to affect me possibly being able to execute my job. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's it's kind of this interesting moment in the NFL where um, um, there's sort of like, I think some like social, I think, I think some players are just like, they don't like how it looks, but also it protects your head. And so, you know, it's, um, 
it's an interesting choice that I think a lot of people have. Do you think you might wear it in NFL games at some point? Yeah, I definitely do think that uh, that's definitely an option for me, um, especially as I continue to to grow with it and working with my equipment staff um, to eliminate any challenges there may be or just make sure that the operation is smooth. You know, one thing we were talking about a lot last year um, is is like the changing nature of the running back position. Um, you're being asked to do different things and also like teams are sort of reassessing, frankly, how how much they, they value running backs um, as a running back. How do you feel like um, – your um your position is being treated by the league right now i definitely think it was a it was a time period where teams may have tried to to devalue the position but i also think that comes through the narrative of the false narrative of you know as running backs hit a certain age their production begins to drop and i think that we're we're seeing that that false narrative is in fact false of you look at you know guys like derrick henry uh people who are you know joe mixon guys who've been in the league for a while whose whose production are is still at a high level so just being able to continue that trend uh of course i'm going to try to follow the trend myself uh just to continue to raise the value of that running back position and um, you know the NFL is you know it's it's expanding in all all sorts of different ways. There's a game in Brazil. You got games in Europe. Um, there's a game on Netflix, which is a different different thing. Um, what are you most excited about in terms of like the directions the league's, league's going? For me, I just want the league, the NFL, to be able to reach across the entire world. I know we uh, you kind of know about how large the soccer universe is and how it's it's everywhere all across the world and. Uh, I just want the NFL to be able to grow to that magnitude so that people all over the world are able to enjoy the game of football because it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And before we let you go, just what are you most excited about for the balance of this season? For me, I think it's continuing to to watch our team grow. We have a pretty young team, so being able to watch them, them grow, um, myself grow, but seeing some of those young guys step up and make plays, uh, I think that's been the most interesting part is – seeing which guys have that certain mentality that it's the next guy up you know and when I have my opportunity I'm going to make the most of it not only for myself but for my teammates because everyone in Indy wants to win yeah absolutely leave it there Jonathan Taylor really appreciate you coming on the show thank you very much I appreciate you taking the time out and helping me today time now for front office sports tomorrow where we look ahead to what's coming in the business of sports the Cleveland Browns are leaving Cleveland for the suburbs. A new era is in store for the Browns after team owners announced they will be leaving their longtime home on the shores of Lake Erie for a new dome stadium in Brook Park, about 15 miles southwest of Cleveland. Cleveland Mayor Justin Bibbs said that the choice is frustrating and profoundly disheartening, but has left the door open for the team to stay downtown if the Brook Park plans fall through, saying, We are ready to return to the table and continue working towards a solution that keeps the Browns in the city that has stood by them for decades and decades and decades, Cleveland, Ohio. The Browns' lease at Huntington Bank is set to expire in 2028, with the team set to leave the following season. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, let us know. We always appreciate hearing from you. You can do that with a review on your podcast platform or a note on social media. Keep an eye out for the weekend series interview. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.